The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, The Return of the Innocent. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. It's almost midnight behind the dark, cold walls of the state penitentiary. The warden and the chaplain, Father Maloney, have just about finished the last of a series of weekly talks with Phil Carter, a series of Saturday night suppers which have been occurring for ten years. This is Phil Carter's last night as a prisoner, and he listens to the chaplain praise the many good things Phil has done for the men inside these walls. And, too, it's amazing, Phil. You've raised the morale of the men here by 50%. Increase the quality of the food and the quantity without a raise in budget from the state. Thank you, Father Maloney. You've instituted recreational and vocational reforms that have endeared you to every man in the place. Your warden? Yes, indeed, Father. Phil is a wizard with figures, an economic wizard. Everything he did, he figured out first on a piece of paper. Phil, I had a talk with the governor today. I don't know what you're planning to do, but, well, if you'd like to stay on here... We can make it more interesting. Stay on, Warden. Don't you think 15 years here has been enough? Yes, I know what you mean. I've spent 20 years behind these walls myself. Well, if you decide, after you look around outside, that you want to come back, there's a good salary waiting for you, Phil. What are your plans, my boy? Why, Father? Why do you ask that? Phil, the Warden and I have been talking about you for a long time now. We're convinced that You came here an innocent man. We believe in you. No man with your attributes, your character, could be a thief. A juggler of books and accounts. That's right, Phil. We think you were framed. But we're uh, worried about your leaving. We feel, well, that you might get yourself into some some real trouble and come back to us in a way we, we wouldn't like to see. And you're offering me this permanent job with the state because you think I've figured out who railroaded me and will seek revenge on that person. Well, now we... Yeah. Well, I have figured it out. I know now who really did it. I know who was responsible for my spending 15 years here. But, gentlemen, on my word of honor, I won't touch a hair of that person's head. When I get tired of roaming around, I may accept your offer as director of prison economy, but I doubt it. I've had enough of prison for one lifetime. Midnight, Phil. You're a free man. The car's waiting to take you to the station. Thanks. Good night, gentlemen. And please don't worry about me. All my intentions are of the best. Whistler fans, can you answer this question? Who brings you the Whistler? I hope you said Signal Oil Company. Because we of the cast have a little favor we hope you'll do for us. You see, radio surveys show that the Whistler has been getting more and more popular each week until today. No program on the West Coast has more listeners than the Whistler. Now, that's mighty good news. We hope it means you're really enjoying this program. If so, then as a favor to us, won't you please tell your neighborhood signal dealer that you enjoy the Whistler? Probably you already know your signal dealer. If not, my bet is you'll agree he's a good man to know. Because being in business for himself, he does the most conscientious job he can in servicing cars. And today, with his thorough experience, plus finer quality signal products, he's doing a great job helping today's aging cars run better and last longer. Yes, and he'll be mighty pleased to know you enjoy the program he's bringing you. So won't you drop in this week and tell your signal dealer you enjoy the Whistler. He'll appreciate it, 
and we of the cast will appreciate your favor. And now, the whistler. So you know now, Phil Carter, who the person is who caused you to spend 15 years in prison for something you did not do. It's Jeff Gilroy, isn't it? You and Jeff Gilroy were junior members of your brother Alan Carter's firm. You and Jeff Gilroy kept the books, but you were nominally the head bookkeeper. So the shortages and the juggling pointed to you, Phil, didn't they? Now Jeff is dominating the business and your brother as well. And soon, Alan will be out on the street. Nothing can be proved against Jeff. There will be no evidence after 15 years. Jeff has undoubtedly seen to that. You might as well forget it. Just drop into the office and see your brother, Alan. Gilroy and Carter? No, Mr. Gilroy is not in. Gilroy and Carter? No, Mr. Carter is not in at the moment. He'll be back in half an hour. Oh, Pardon me, miss. Mr. Carter not in, nor Mr. Gilroy? No, Mr. Carter is out for a while, and Mr. Gilroy has gone to see his doctor. Oh, isn't Mr. Gilroy feeling well? No, Mr. Gilroy has had a number of attacks lately, and he's been visiting the doctor several times. <laughs> Just who are you? Why, I'm, I'm Mr. Jones. I had an appointment with him. Well, he never returns to the office when he goes to the doctor's. I presume he's gone to Dr... What is his name, Dr... Uh, Dr. Benton. Yes, Dr. Benton. He's in the... Uh... In the Hellman building. He's a specialist, I think. Specialist? Oh, of course. Dr. Benton, in the Hellman building. I'll try to catch him there. Well, if you care to see Mr. Alan Carter, he'll be back in a short while. No, thank you. If I miss Mr. Gilroy, I'll come back in the morning. Good day. So, Jeff Gilroy is not well, eh? visiting a specialist. And what kind of a specialist? The telephone directory lists Dr. Benton as a cardiologist. A heart specialist. So you stand, staring for a few moments, Phil. Something is going through your mind. What is it? A few minutes later, you're standing in the third floor hall of the Hellman building. A man comes out of Dr. Benton's office. It's Jeff Gilroy. Yes, there he is, Phil, a man you hate. Jeff Gilroy, puffy and fat from too much high living. But you turn aside. He doesn't see you as he steps into the elevator and disappears. Then another minute or so, and you, Phil Carter, are standing in Dr. Benton's consultation room. Sit down, uh, Mr. Gilroy. Gilroy. Well, uh, that's strange. I mean the Gilroy. Well, I was told my brother Jeff had come here. I've just arrived in town, haven't seen him for 15 years or more. They said at his office that he was here. Yes, he left just a few minutes ago. Oh? Well, I'm quite disturbed about the sign on your door. Are you a heart specialist, Doctor? I am. Well, there's never been anyone in our family afflicted with heart trouble. How serious is it? Well, Jeff Gilroy is in a bad condition. Myocarditis. Inflammation of the heart muscle. What can be done about it? Oh, he's a stubborn man. Doubt that anything can be done about it. His, his blood pressure is most alarming. He... Works too much and drinks too much. And if he doesn't get away from his office and take a rest very soon, he'll go out like a light. And he's overweight, too. You mean he's liable to drop dead? Yes, yes. A few minutes ago, I was able to impress him sufficiently so that he promised to take it easier. Well, oh, thanks, Doctor. I'll see if there's something I can do about that. Good afternoon. Well, there's a sardonic smile on your lips as you leave the doctors. This is what might be called poetic justice, isn't it, Phil? Jeff Gilroy liable to drop dead at any moment. It's more than you'd hope for, but can you leave it at that, Phil? After all the hours of hating him, can you leave it at that? No. Phil Carter steps into a telephone booth and makes a call. A call to Jeff Gilroy's home. Just a short talk with old David the butler. But it'll be enough, won't it, Phil? You'd like to be there when Jeff arrives, wouldn't you? 
Good evening, Mr. Gilroy. How do you feel? Oh, I don't know, David. I always seem to feel worse when I visit that specialist, thanks. All he does is try to scare me to thinking I'm falling apart mentally and physically. Well, you have had several bad attacks lately, sir. Oh, boss, you're as bad as that specialist. Forget it. Anybody call? Uh, yes, sir. There was a gentleman from the insurance company called this afternoon. Insurance company? What insurance company? I don't know, sir. He, he said the office informed him you'd gone home for the afternoon. Well, what did he want? He wanted to tell you that his company couldn't issue that policy on your life. What? On my life? I haven't applied for a policy. He said to tell you that 100000 was a large policy, and they'd found it necessary to check up on your condition and learned that you were much too bad a risk because of your heart condition. Who was this man? Did he tell you? Oh, yes, he, he told me, and he told me the name of his company, but I can't remember either, sir. I thought you'd know about oh, it. Oh, confound you, David. You're an old fool. I should have gotten rid of you years ago. Uh, sorry, sir. $100,000 policy, eh? And they checked on my condition. Give me that phone. <laughs> Doctor, this is Jeffrey Gilroy. Just what do you mean by shooting your mouth off to other people about my so-called heart condition? What? Why, I don't understand, Mr. Gilroy. Have you told my partner, Alan Carter, about my condition? I have never met your partner. I've told no one except your brother this afternoon. My brother? I never had a brother. That man was an investigator from an insurance company. Oh, oh well, I, uh, I'm sorry about that. But try to get yourself under control, Mr. Gilroy. I've warned you about the results of excitement. Yes, all right. Goodbye. Well, how do you like that? Now, who would want to take out a $100,000 policy on... Except... Hmm. So that's my partner, Alan Carter. Oh. Hello? Alan, you get over to my place immediately. What? What? Who is this? It's Jeff Gilroy, your partner. Get over here, now. <laughs> Well, Alan, what delayed you? Delayed me, Jeff? I couldn't have come any faster. Well, what's wrong with you? Your face is red as fire. Why shouldn't it be? What do you mean by trying to take out an insurance policy on my life without consulting me? What kind of a scheme have you got up your sleeve? I? An insurance policy? On you? Well, why should I attempt to do anything like that? Did you figure it was an easy way to pick up 100000 Well, I'll tell you this much. I'm going to outlive you. What do you think of that? Jeff, you're absolutely out of your mind. I don't even know what you're talking about. Now, now, take it easy. Uh... An insurance investigator went to that specialist I've been visiting. The man posed as my brother and got the dope from the doctor that I had heart trouble. Heart trouble? I didn't know that. No? Then the insurance agent called here and explained that they couldn't issue a policy on my life. Well, if I took it out or applied for a policy, why would they call you? Wouldn't they call me about that? Huh? Oh. Well, I never thought of that. I... I certainly didn't apply for a policy. I know you're in a bad condition, but such a thought never occurred to me. So you think I'm in a bad condition? Well, any fool could see that. You're too stubborn to take a rest. You won't listen to anyone, not even a specialist. And if you haven't applied for a policy, why did that insurance agent call here? Who was he? What company? Oh, I don't know. That stupid old David can't remember. Jeff, Jeff, you're shaking like a leaf. Come on, man, buck up. Oh, Alan, I've, I've got the strangest feeling of sort of a premonition. Premonition? Of what? I don't know. I don't know how to express it. Disaster. Disaster? Concerning yourself? Or the business? Myself. And it isn't my heart condition that worries me. Oh, nonsense. You're imagining things, Jeff. Come on, let's go down to the club. We'll mix with some of the boys and try to forget all this. It'll do you good. All right. I'll go. I may even stay at the club for the night. I I don't know why, but I don't want to stay in this place all alone. Are you afraid to be alone, Jeff? I don't know what's come over me, but I'm going to stay at the club. <laughs> Well, Phil Carter, it's too bad you couldn't have been listening in on that scene between your brother Alan and his partner, Jeff Gilroy. You'd have known just how well your plan was developing. But your guess is pretty good, then you're determined to follow it through anyway. You sit across from Jeff's home and watch the two men leave. You follow them to the club, and later you watch Alan leave. Jeff stayed at the club. You found that out. And so you wait until you're sure he's in bed and... Hello? Hello? Hello, who is this? <laughs> Hello? Hello, what? Who? Hello? Hello, who is this? What do you mean by calling up in the middle of the night? What is all this? <laughs> 
Stop it. Stop it. Hello. Hello. Stop it. Do you hear? Stop it. I'm a sick man. You can't do this to me. Stop it. <laughs> For God's sake, what are you doing? Who is this? Who? Hello. Hello. Who is this? Hello. Good morning, Jeff. It's Alan. <laughs> What's the matter? Alan? Don't you feel well, Jeff? Alan, I... I haven't slept a wink all night. Somebody's been calling me, getting me up, and then just laughing until I'm nearly frantic. I don't know what's going on. Take it easy, old fellow. Someone's just playing a joke on you. A joke? Or maybe it's just a mistake. Anyway, maybe this is just what you need. What? I'm up at my mountain place. I got one of those terrific sinus attacks about midnight and drove up here during the night. High altitude always helps. Yeah? It's nice and quiet up here, Jeff. I've decided to stay a couple of weeks. It's just what you need. Come on up. But I don't feel like driving, Alan. I'd like to, but I... I know. But I called the Crosby Motor livery, and there's a car waiting for you in front of the club now. Pile in as you are and come on up. You'll be here in a few hours. It's nice and quiet. Just what you need. All right, Alan. All right. I'll leave immediately. Goodbye. <laughs> It worked, didn't it, Phil? He didn't recognize your voice. You always did talk enough like Alan to fool people if you wanted to, even Jeff. And he's fooled, all right, because he's headed for the Carter Lodge in the mountains where Phil Carter is waiting. Yes, you've arranged quite a reception, haven't you, Phil? With a roaring log fire in the fireplace and everything. Very pleasant for a stormy day like this one. Then you disconnected the telephone, didn't you? So Jeff's rest won't be disturbed and took a single thirty-eight cartridge from the ammunition box next to the gun rack. So you're all ready when the hired limousine pulls up around three o'clock in the afternoon and Jeff is there. But then, you don't greet him, do you? No, you let him wander around, calling for Alan and wondering. Alan! Alan, where are you? It takes him several minutes to find the notes you left him. <laughs> Gone to the village for supplies. Back in a few hours. Alan. Oh. Jeff walks about nervously for a while, and at last, becoming exhausted, he drops in a chair and falls into a fretful sleep. Two hours pass. Jeff jumps up with a start after searching the place to see if Alan has arrived as he rushes to the phone. Hello? 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 <laughs> Dead as a doornail. Reach for the shield and... Huh? It... Ben! Ben, what's the matter with you? Put down that rifle. Hmm? You know me? Well, I don't know you. I'm the caretaker. I'm Jeff Gilroy. Jeff Gilroy. Jeff Gilroy, eh? I knew Jeff Gilroy once. The funny thing, though, looked a little like you. I'm the same Jeff Gilroy, you crazy Ben. Well, now... How did you know my name was Ben? I'm Jeff Gilroy, and I'll put up that gun. I'm nervous enough as it is. Where's Mr. Carter? Mr. Carter? Uh, Alan Carter? Certainly, my partner. Why, he's in, uh, he's at his office. He's not at his office, he's here. Is he? I ain't seen him. Uh, when did he get here, Mr. Gilroy? He called me at ten o'clock this morning and asked me to come up here. He called from here. Why, how could he do that? Oh. How long has this phone been out of order? It ain't out of order. Leastwise, it weren't at 12 o'clock noon today. I called Mr. Carter at his office at noon. At, at noon? From this phone? Oh, I sure. I wanted to know if he was planning to come up here in the next three days. I wanted to visit my sister in the village. And, and what did he say? Oh, he said he wouldn't be up here for a couple of weeks. Who built that big fire? What? I thought you did. No, I didn't. Well, I gotta run along now. If you want me, I'll be at my cabin a half mile up the mountain. Just up the main road and turn off when you come to the big signal oil station. I see you in the morning. Good night. Phil watches Jeff Gilroy's nervous pacing about the room for a while. Then he reconnects the phone wire, slips to the upstairs phone, and calls his brother Alan in the city. Hello, Alan. Did you get that note suggesting you check over the financial affairs of your company instead of playing so much golf? Yes, I got it. But, but have you checked on those affairs yet? Yes, I have. Who is this? 
<laughs> I'm the man you wouldn't believe 15 years ago. I'm the man you prosecuted. I'm your brother, Phil. Phil? What? Where are you? Oh, I'm in town. I've been out a few days. How does it feel to find out you prosecuted the wrong man? <laughs> There's no proof of any irregularity. There was no proof 15 years ago, Alan. Now I'm going to get the proof myself. So long, Alan. Phil? Phil! Phil Carter slips back to the head of the stairs and enjoys himself by watching Jeff Gilroy's increasing tension, his heavy, labored breathing. Jeff is terribly worried. He manages to place more wood on the fire, but tries his best to keep away from the windows. About 8.30. Hello. Hello? Jeff, this is Alan. Alan? Where are you? I'm at the office. Office? Well, you asked me to come up here to the lodge. I've been at the lodge all day. What did you leave for? I haven't been at the lodge for a week or more. But you called me from here this morning. What's the matter with you, Jeff? I just called the club and they told me where you were. Are you out of your mind? I, I don't know, Alan. I, I don't know, but I... I just heard some interesting news, Jeff. My brother Phil was paroled three days ago. Phil? Phil, that's it. That's what's been going on. It's Phil. He's after me. What are you talking about? He hates me. He thinks I had something to do with his prison sentence. Alan, I can't stay here alone. Come and get me. Come and get me, do you hear? Yes, I hear. I'll come. Goodbye. Alan. Alan, hello. Hello. Hello, Jeff. Phil. Phil. Don't, don't. Don't what, Jeff? It's a gun in your pocket, I know. Please don't. Jeff, Please take do... that chair facing the fireplace. Please now don't. sit down and try to relax. Please. Or can you relax in your last hours, Jeff? Last hours? Phil? Look, Phil, listen to me. I... Sit down. Yes. Yes, there. I'm a sick man, Phil, a sick man. Then you won't mind, perhaps, what's going to happen. You're going to sit there. And I'm going to stand here in front of the fire, and you're going to tell me all about it. A confession is sometimes good for one's soul. Confession? What are you talking about? Don't play innocent, Jeff. Not after those 15 years I spent. It's too late to play innocent. Phil, Phil, honestly, I don't know what you're talking about. On the exact don't stroke of 12, I'm going to put a bullet about... through you, Jeff. No. And you know why. No, Phil, no, no, you, no, you can't. Come on, Jeff, talk. You be... Talk. You talk. <laughs> There it is, Jeff. Hmm? It's starting to strike 12. You've only got a few more seconds to start talking. Go on, Jeff. Go on, tell me all about it. No. Tell me how you sent an innocent man to prison for a crime you committed. No, Phil, no. No, I didn't. You're wrong. Please, Phil, you've got to listen to me. You've got to listen Confession to me. or not, Jeff, you're going to die in a few seconds. I've waited 15 years for this. No, 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 Phil. No. Ten. Eleven. Please, Phil. Please, I'm on my knees. Now, Jeff, oh, now! No, no! <laughs> Stone dead. And not a mark on you, Jeff. I didn't even touch you. Not a hair on your head. <laughs> That's not all to tonight's story. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's tale. Meantime, the Office of War Information has asked Signal Oil Company to inform car owners there will be 40% fewer new tires for civilian drivers during April, May, and June than during the past three months. And President Roosevelt has warned that the only way to be sure your car will be kept running is to make your present equipment last. Well, fortunately, tires can be retreaded more than once if the inner carcass is in sound condition. Small injuries should be repaired promptly before they spread and weaken the tire. And the tread must not be worn too thin before retreading. Because surveys show that three out of every four tires today need either some kind of repair or retreading, you'll be wise to have your tires thoroughly inspected. Your signal gasoline dealer, being a trained expert at tire care, will not only be glad to inspect your tires, 
but he's completely equipped for all types of tire repair and retreading. All of the top quality that the name Signal stands for. But most important, don't put off this tire service until your car is laid up. Plan now to make your tires last by having them Signal serviced this week. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Phil Carter, you accomplished your purpose, didn't you? You avenged your injustice and still kept your promise to the warden. Jeff Gilroy is dead and you didn't touch a hair on his head. No, you only dropped that thirty-eight cartridge into the fire where it exploded harmlessly. But was it, it was enough. Too much for Jeff's heart. It wasn't exactly murder, was it? Except you did know his heart was weak. Another thing, Phil... Didn't it surprise you a little, the fact that Jeff wouldn't confess? Didn't that make you stop and wonder a little? It should have. But then you found that out soon enough. It was just a few minutes after 12. You were just about to leave the lodge when your brother Alan arrived. You were in the hallway and he didn't see you. But he saw Jeff slumped over the chair in front of the fire. And as he walked up, you saw the gun he had in his hand. All right, Jeff. Don't move. Just give it to me quick. What is this that you and Phil are trying to pull? Thought you were pretty smart, didn't you, getting me up here on a trick like this? Well, I came, but I'm ready for you. If you two think you can pin that embezzlement on me after all these years, and all the trouble I've taken to cover up, I'll kill you both before I'll admit anything. And you can't prove a thing. Neither of you. Do you hear me? You can't prove a thing on me. Jeff. Jeff! He can't hear you, Alan. He's dead. <laughs> Stay where you are. You needn't be afraid of me, Alan. I won't do anything to you. you. You killed him? The coroner's jury will say he died of a heart attack. But you frightened him to death. Yes. For something he didn't do. Something you did. I? Don't worry, Alan. It doesn't matter anymore. For 15 years, I've hated the wrong man. Now there's nothing left. I won't cause you any trouble. You needn't shoot me or worry about me. What do you mean? I'm going back. Back to prison? Yes. They offered me a job there. I just killed a man. I'm going back. For the rest of my life. It's really where I belong, you know. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with story by J. Donald Wilson, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting you let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.